This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Lemoyne. Green, K -R -I dot com. The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus by L. Frank Baum. Old Age. Chapter Two. When the World Grew Old. The next morning, when Santa Claus opened his eyes and gazed around the familiar room, which he had feared he might never see again, he was astonished to find his old strength renewed, and to feel the red blood of perfect health coursing through his veins. He sprang from his bed and stood where the bright sunshine came in through his window and flooded him with its merry dancing rays. He did not then understand what had happened to restore him to the vigor of youth, but in spite of the fact that his beard remained the color of snow, and that wrinkles still lingered in the corners of his bright eyes, old Santa Claus felt as brisk and merry as a boy of sixteen, and was soon whistling contentedly as he busied himself fashioning new toys. Then Ack came to him, and told of the mantle of immortality, and how Claus had won it through his love for little children. It made Santa look grave for a moment, to think he had been so favored, but it also made him glad to realize that now he need never fear being parted from his dear ones. At once he began preparations for making a remarkable assortment of pretty and amusing playthings, and in larger quantities than ever before, for now that he might always devote himself to this work, he decided that no child in the world, poor or rich, should hereafter go without a Christmas gift, if he could manage to supply it. The world was new in the days when dear old Santa Claus first began toy-making, and won by his loving deeds the mantle of immortality and the task of supplying cheering words, sympathy, and pretty playthings to all the young of his race did not seem a difficult undertaking at all. But every year more and more children were born into the world, and these, when they grew up, began spreading slowly over all the face of the earth, seeking new homes, so that Santa Claus found each year that his journeys must extend farther and farther from the Laughing Valley and that the packs of toys must be made larger and ever larger. So, at length, he took counsel with his fellow immortals, how his work might keep pace with the increasing number of children, that none might be neglected. And the immortals were so greatly interested in his labors, that they gladly rendered him their assistance. Ack gave him his man, Kilter, the silent and swift, and the Nook Prince gave him Peter, who was more crooked and less surly than any of his brothers. And the Rill Prince gave him Nutter, the sweetest tempered Rill ever known. And the Fairy Queen gave him Whisk, that tiny, mischievous, but lovable fairy, who knows today almost as many children as does Santa Claus himself. With these people to help make the toys and to keep his house in order, and to look after the sledge and the harness, Santa Claus found it much easier to prepare his yearly load of gifts, and his days began to follow one another smoothly and pleasantly. Yet after a few generations his worries were renewed, for it was remarkable how the number of people continued to grow, and how many more children there were every year to be served. When the people filled all the cities and lands of one country, they wandered into another part of the world, and the men cut down the trees in many of the great forests that had been ruled by Ack, and with the wood they built new cities, and where the forests had been were fields of grain and herds of browsing cattle. You might think the master woodsman would rebel at the loss of his forests, but not so. The wisdom of Ack was mighty and far-seeing. The world was made for men, said he to Santa Claus, and I have but guarded the forests until men needed them for their use. 
I am glad my strong trees can furnish shelter for men's weak bodies, and warm them through the cold winters. But I hope they will not cut down all the trees, for mankind needs the shelter of the woods in summer as much as the warmth of blazing logs in winter. And however crowded the world may grow, I do not think men will ever come to Burzee, nor to the great black forest, nor to the wooded wilderness of Braz, unless they seek their shades for pleasure, and not to destroy their giant trees. By and by people made ships from the tree trunks, and crossed over oceans, and built cities in far lands, but the oceans made little difference to the journeys of Santa Claus. His reindeer sped over the waters as swiftly as over land, and his sledge headed from east to west, and followed in the wake of the sun, so that as the earth rolled slowly over, Santa Claus had all of twenty-four hours to encircle it each Christmas Eve, and the speedy reindeer enjoyed these wonderful journeys more and more. So, year after year, and generation after generation, and century after century, the world grew older, and the people became more numerous, and the labors of Santa Claus steadily increased. The fame of his good deeds spread to every household where children dwelt, and all the little ones loved him dearly, and the fathers and mothers honored him for the happiness he had given them when they too were young and the aged grandsires and granddams remembered him with tender gratitude and blessed his name. Chapter 3 The Deputies of Santa Claus However, there was one evil following in the path of civilization that caused Santa Claus a vast amount of trouble before he discovered a way to overcome it. But, fortunately, it was the last trial he was forced to undergo. One Christmas Eve, when his reindeer had leaped to the top of a new building, Santa Claus was surprised to find that the chimney had been built much smaller than usual. But he had no time to think about it just then, so he drew in his breath and made himself as small as possible and slid down the chimney. I ought to be at the bottom by this time he thought, as he continued to slip downward. But no fireplace of any sort met his view, and by and by he reached the very end of the chimney, which was in the cellar. "'This is odd,' he reflected, much puzzled by this experience. "'If there is no fireplace, what on earth is the chimney good for?' Then he began to climb out again, and found it hard work, the space being so small. And on his way up he noticed a thin, round pipe sticking through the side of the chimney, but could not guess what it was for. Finally he reached the roof and said to the reindeer, "'There was no need of my going down that chimney, for I could find no fireplace through which to enter the house.' I fear the children who live there must go without playthings this Christmas. Then he drove on, but soon came to another new house, with a small chimney. This caused Santa Claus to shake his head doubtfully, but he tried the chimney nevertheless and found it exactly like the other. Moreover, he nearly stuck fast in the narrow flue and tore his jacket trying to get out again. So although he came to several such chimneys that night, he did not venture to descend any more of them. "'What in the world are people thinking of, to build such useless chimneys?' he exclaimed. "'In all the years I have travelled with my reindeer, I have never seen the like before.' True enough, but Santa Claus had not then discovered that stoves had been invented, and were fast coming into use. When he did find it out, he wondered how the builders of those houses could have so little consideration for him, when they knew very well it was his custom to climb down chimneys and enter houses by way of the fireplaces. Perhaps the men who built those houses had outgrown their own love for toys, and were indifferent whether Santa Claus called on their children or not. Whatever the explanation might be, 
the poor children were forced to bear the burden of grief and disappointment. The following year Santa Claus found more and more of the new-fashioned chimneys, that had no fireplaces, and the next year still more. The third year, so numerous had the narrow chimneys become, he even had a few toys left in his sledge that he was unable to give away, because he could not get to the children. The matter had now become so serious that it worried the good man greatly, and he decided to talk it over with Kilter and Peter and Nutter and Whisk. Kilter already knew something about it, for it had been his duty to run around to all the houses just before Christmas and gather up the notes and letters to Santa Claus that the children had written, telling what they wished to put in their stockings or hung on their Christmas trees. But Kilter was a silent fellow, and seldom spoke of what he saw in the cities and villages. The others were very indignant. "'Those people act as if they do not wish their children to be made happy,' said sensible Peter in a vexed tone. "'The idea of shutting out such a generous friend to their little ones!' "'But it is my intention to make children happy whether their parents wish it or not,' returned Santa Claus. Years ago, when I first began making toys, children were even more neglected by their parents than they are now, so I have learned to pay no attention to thoughtless or selfish parents, but to consider only the longings of childhood. "'You are right, my master,' said Nutter, the Rill. "'Many children would lack a friend if you did not consider them, and try to make them happy.' "'Then,' declared the laughing Whisk, we must abandon any thought of using these new-fashioned chimneys, but become burglars and break into the houses some other way." "'What way?' asked Santa Claus. "'Why, walls of brick and wood and plaster are nothing to fairies. I can easily pass through them whenever I wish, and so can Peter, and Nutter, and Kilter. Is it not so, comrades?' "'I often pass through the walls when I gather up the letters,' said Kilter. And that was a long speech for him, and so surprised Peter and Nutter that their big round eyes nearly popped out of their heads. "'Therefore,' continued the fairy, "'you may as well take us with you on your next journey, and when we come to one of those houses with the stoves instead of the fireplaces, we will distribute the toys to the children without the need of using a chimney.' "'That seems to me a good plan,' replied Santa Claus, well pleased at having solved the problem. "'We will try it next year.' That was how the fairy, the pixie, the nook, and the rill all rode in the sledge with their master the following Christmas Eve, and they had no trouble at all in entering the new-fashioned houses and leaving toys for the children that lived in them and their deft services not only relieved Santa Claus of much labor, but enabled him to complete his own work more quickly than usual, so that the merry party found themselves at home with an empty sledge a full hour before daybreak. The only drawback to the journey was that the mischievous whisk persisted in tickling the reindeer with the long feather to see them jump, and Santa Claus found it necessary to watch him every minute and to tweak his long ears once or twice to make him behave himself. But, taken altogether, the trip was a great success, and to this day the four little folk always accompany Santa Claus on his yearly ride, and help him in the distribution of his gifts. But the indifference of parents, which had so annoyed the good saint, did not continue very long and Santa Claus soon found they were really anxious he should visit their homes on Christmas Eve and leave presents for their children. So, to lighten his task, which was fast becoming very difficult indeed, old Santa decided to ask the parents to assist him. "'Get your Christmas trees all ready for my coming,' he said to them, "'and then I shall be able to leave the presents without loss of time, and you can put them on the trees when I am gone.' And to others he said, See that the children's stockings are hung up in readiness for my coming, and then I can fill them as quick as a wink. 
and often, when parents were kind and good-natured, Santa Claus would simply fling down his package of gifts, and leave the fathers and mothers to fill the stockings after he had darted away in his sledge. "'I will make all loving parents my deputies,' cried the jolly old fellow, "'and they shall help me to do my work, for in this way I shall save many precious minutes, and few children need be neglected for lack of time to visit them.' Besides carrying around the big packs in his swift flying sledge, old Santa began to send great heaps of toys to the toy shops, so that if parents wanted larger supplies for their children, they could easily get them. And if any children were, by chance, missed by Santa Claus on his yearly rounds, they could go to the toy shops and get enough to make them happy and contented. For the loving friend of the little ones decided that no child, if he could help it, should long for toys in vain. And the toy shops also proved convenient whenever a child fell ill, and needed a new toy to amuse it. And sometimes, on birthdays, the fathers and mothers go to the toy shops, and get pretty gifts for their children in honor of the happy event. Perhaps you will now understand how, in spite of the bigness of the world, Santa Claus is able to supply all the children with beautiful gifts. To be sure, the old gentleman is rarely seen in these days. But it is not because he tries to keep out of sight, I assure you. Santa Claus is the same loving friend of children that in the old days used to play and romp with them by the hour. And I know he would love to do the same now, if he had the time. But you see, he is so busy all the year making toys, and is so hurried on that one night when he visits our homes with his packs that he comes and goes among us like a flash. It is almost impossible to catch a glimpse of him. And, although there are millions and millions more children in the world than there used to be, Santa Claus has never been known to complain of their increasing numbers. "'The more the merrier!' he cries, with his jolly laugh. And the only difference to him is the fact that his little workmen have to make their busy fingers fly faster every year to satisfy the demands of so many little ones. "'In all this world there is nothing so beautiful as a happy child,' says good old Santa Claus. And if he had his way the children would all be beautiful, for all would be happy. End of chapter 3 End of the life and adventures of Santa Claus.